Welcome, everyone. I am thrilled to be joined by Gareth Russell today for our podcast. Gareth, as I'm sure you know, has written a number of books about all kinds of people and all kinds of times. I have a couple of them here. We're going to be talking about this one, and this just happens to be one of my favorites because I think Catherine Howard um, is, is such a misunderstood story. And so I'm so grateful for that book. I also have a whole bunch on my iPad. I'm not going to hold up for you, but <laughs> thank, thank you. you so much. In fact, this one, I will just say I was in the UK um, a couple of weeks ago. So I was a able to buy it and bring it back on the plane with me and read oh, it. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering, you had the, the UK edition. Yeah, yes, excellent. I do. Yeah, I was yeah, so excited yeah. to get that. I just walked into the bookstore and I was thrilled. I'm sure the book out. <laughs> Why is this woman well, so good. happy? But, good. Thank you. So I have that version and I'm so excited to have it. So um, let me just run through a bunch of your works. The Illustrated Introduction to the Tudors, The Emperors, How Europe's Rulers Were Destroyed by the First World War, A History of the English Monarchy, Young, Damned, and Fair, I showed you that, Catherine Howard, Ship of Dreams, The Sinking of the Titanic, and End of the Edwardian Era, and now, Do Let's Have Another Drink, which is, of course, this wonderful biography of the Queen Mother. So how have you sort of, this is a huge range that you cover. Do you have any favorite eras or, or do yeah. you just get drawn to things? I suppose it's, yeah, I mean, I suppose there is a definite bouncing between the 1500s and the early 1900s. <laughs> Absolutely. So I suppose that Hilary Mantel said you should only ever have two that you're obsessed with. Uh, I think hers were the Tudors and the French Revolution, if memory serves. That's what she said. Um, I, yeah, those are probably my two main ones. The French Revolution in ancient Egypt, honorable mentions in Byzantium. There's a lot mm. of history so interesting. <laughs> but um as with well, the history of the English monarchy, my postgraduate was medieval history. So that kind of lent itself to that. But it's quite nice. You, um, if you do the 16th century ones, particularly young and damned and fair, you spend like a very long time translating 16th century handwriting. And particularly in Catherine's case, there's very detailed records from the interro interrogation. Detailed, not legible. <laughs> and um and so after, I think what, you know, Catherine Young and Down Affair was on and off for five years. So, uh, and then two solid years of, of just it. So by the end of it, I I needed to not look at 16th century handwriting for right. a while. Right. Um, because I remember I was in a church where one of the, the scribes was buried and I felt like this irrational, you know, loathing <laughs> because it's such terrible handwriting. <laughs> and I thought that was the time to time, time to move on. So when it when, so when it's time to look at um, you know, some some fountain pen cursor for typed, I go to the 20th century for a couple of years and back. But I mean the 16th century is it feels a little bit more like home, but interesting. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know whether I have a favorite. I mean, I, the do let's have another drink and young and damned and fair were probably the two favorite to, to write. So, okay. so okay. That, kind of, that is the answer answerless, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's fitting for this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I know you've done some video work as well, specifically on Anne Boleyn. Yeah. So what's that been like as, a, as another means of sharing these stories? Sure. I mean, I've done like obviously some YouTube videos and then I did, um, that was a talking head for the Berlins, the, the, mm -hmm. the series that came up with P, uh, the BBC and PBS. And yeah, I mean, it's extraordinary. I mean, certainly I was lucky enough to, I do work as a Royal correspondent as well in the UK and the US. So with the Platinum Jubilee and then with mm -hmm. the death of Elizabeth II and the accession of Charles III, and then obviously with the Duke of Sussex's memoir, it's been a fairly busy time. Right. And that's quite nice because I um, I had done, you know, really the Ship of Dreams, my book on the Titanic was the first one I had done where it was nothing but that. Previously, I had been working on uh, in some theatre productions of stories and comedies that written set in Belfast in another lifetime but uh and so Titanic was the first time I was really just day in day out writing on my own and researching on my own it's not a, it's not great for you for you mentally particularly <laughs> when, particularly when you're just spending all your time surrounded by but but you know the, 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 it's not a spoiler to say the Titanic is not a happy ending <laughs> it's not a happy ending uh, right? yeah yeah <laughs> so um yeah, I suppose in that sense, I um, what's been really exciting about doing the, the correspondence work and the, the 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 documentary work is it's collaborative again and it varies right. things. So that's been really exciting, and you do have to, you know, it is 
collaborative. I had not realized how many people assume that the the presenters have complete control over what goes into it and and really there is none mm -hmm. there is absolutely none and you're sort of a little you know i i was quite lucky people were very lovely but i had a couple of friends who'd worked on one show I'd, I'd worked on and they got some really nasty um comments and you sort of like i you don't expect anyone else in the world to explain to you the the really dull bits of how their job works <laughs> before um <laughs> but but there really is no say and in some ways that's frustrating but on the other hand and i'm probably in the minority in this it's quite uh liberating or exciting to be collaborative again i quite i really right. like working with people and i think it's in the same way debate sharpens your mind i think collaboration sharpens your heart or your soul a bit because you have to work with other people and listen to other people's ideas and i just think that's a that's a different way to tell a story and an exciting way to, to work so i'm lucky now that i have the books where i can really focus on telling stories in a lot of detail and then the the television where it's it's shorter and, it, and it's a different way to, to impart information well i think that's great and i it is nice to see you having an opportunity to do both and as a consumer of both of your ways of doing <laughs> things i really enjoy because then i see you talking about say thomas howard and i think okay i'm going to go back and read more about that in the yeah. book about Catherine howard you know and so yeah. it's a really nice um so i love it but I would imagine some of the more recent stuff. I mean, it, last year was quite a year with all the, I was in the UK a yeah. couple of times in February, yeah. everybody was so excited about the Jubilee and getting ready and everybody's talking about it. When I went back in October, the sadness was palpable. Right. You know, it was about three weeks after the queen had passed and it just, everybody was talking about it and everybody was sad and people were walking the route. And that's what my friend wanted to do. Oh, let's walk the route of the hurt. I mean, it was just this very sad. Yeah thing and so well it was it I mean I don't really remember the week the 10 days of the national morning because it was a level it, you were you were kind of I mean you would have like four white shirts mm -hmm. because you would just be having to you know you have to go on black tie and mm -hmm. so you don't have to but you should you know you should and um and so it was it was you were like falling asleep for one hour two hours and then you were up it was just it was it was manic and it right. was um, a really strange moment where the past and the present and history and modernity just seemed to flow right into each other. Right. So that was extraordinary. It was a great privilege to be able to do it because you were able, hopefully, to bring some knowledge of history into this, right. into this event. And yes, it has been, it's been energy-wise challenging, but I very much enjoy being busy. That doesn't bother me. I think the Duke of Sussex's memoir has been a, right. has been a different experience because yeah. the passions that it has provoked and invoked are quite intense. And mm -hmm. what is interesting is I have you know I've I've seen someone be you know torn apart for being anti Megan and pro Megan at the same time. I mean it's just it's or anti um, William pro William. It's uh, it's an extraordinary thing, and I think what's interesting. So my undergraduate dissertation in history was on how do we make historical reputations? And I looked at um, okay. Marie Antoinette and I, and it's some of these things don't change. I mean, they, everyone yes. thinks it's new, every, but it's not. It, it's, <laughs> right. um, it, Harry, Meghan, William, Catherine, they have become touchstone. And by the mm -hmm. way, this is not to take away from the fact that these are four real people and that there is a truth between what one is saying and the other. There is, of course there will be. Um, but anyone you know if you're looking at how we respond to culture right these uh, us royalty have always been they become symbols for mm -hmm. for things that you believe in or things that you've experienced and it's it, it, it's a tightrope because sometimes um people so if we're going in a more pro harry element uh, sometimes when you point out like a factual error people can get very very upset by this because they it turns out when you talk to them a little bit, they have been in a position where they have said something and they've been in pain and their family haven't believed them. And then the, also on the other side, if you're trying to be, if you're trying to sort of explain away inconsistencies or to say, look, there are mistakes in every mm -hmm. memoir. I've read memoirs of Titanic survivors that swear until they are blue in the face. I saw it sink in one piece. Mm -hmm. And we now know that it's, it, it's, it's thousands of feet apart. On right, the, on the right, right. 
Um, and these people, be- I, I don't believe they were lying, but I be- believe there were mistakes and trying to say, mm-hmm. look, if you've worked with memoirs before, they're interesting, they're fascinating, they're personal, but th- there is no memoir where there is no mistake. And, but some when you're trying to say it like that, people who maybe have been in a position where they have been lied to by, you know, they then feel that you're trying to justify deception. So this book and, the, and that correspondency work, is it, it taps into hundreds, dozens, sorry, I should say not hundreds, dozens of different issues that people feel very, very strongly about. And often a lot of them are very personal to them. Right. So I suppose the only one I've really kind of pushed back on a little bit is when... Um, I, some people have said it was bullying Harry to, 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 to say this is this, this particular bit wasn't, wasn't accurate. That's just not how a book works. It, it, it once right. you, once you write a book, you become an author. They're all critiqued. That's just, mm-hmm. that's just the nature mm-hmm. of it. And I don't believe it's very respectful to him not to say, we're not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to touch right. the, 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 the inaccuracies in it because there is, there, there are uh, not this is not just him any memoir there are mm-hmm. bits of it that are relevant sorry all of it's relevant but not all of it will be accurate there just isn't a memoir in the world where there were where every detail is accurately remembered but it is worth reminding of people of that because every time a memoir comes out there tends to be a period where people believe everything that's in it right and, and so i've just and it, and it was interesting to me because some of the things that he talks about to me are 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 particularly the early on stuff is quite reminiscent of survivors of the titanic there's um oh okay there's there's the risk there's the there's the behavior the kind of the very risky behavior Mm -hmm. um of him trying to there's a bit where he talks about getting his chauffeur to Mm -hmm. speed through the tunnel where his mother died Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. at exactly the same speed that that interestingly is a trauma response and so we we see it with some Titanic survivors. I find that fascinating. That I think there are, there were, um, and also actually interestingly, I'm not sure this is the, the closest analysis, but it reminded me of quite a few survivors of the Russian Revolution, like emigres who'd gone abroad, okay. where they have this slightly, they have very extreme responses, and they have quite a high risk threshold, and a lot of them had had also lost parents, and and what is interesting among the Russian emigres and among Prince Harry was this feeling that the person who'd done it, who'd taken this family member from them was not being punished. In their case, communism okay. is, is the media. Mm-hmm. So it's really interesting mm-hmm. in the history of memoirs where this lands. But uh, I was um, I was sort of intrigued just by the way, by, by the way people reacted to it. And I say mm-hmm. all that with a slight dispassionate tone which I, I absolutely understand. Neither he feels that, nor do I imagine any of the people who are mentioned in it feel that feel that way either. And right. I'm absolutely not detracting from the personal element of this. It's just to say, oh, excuse me, look, in the context of yes. memoir, this is something to look out for. It's quite interesting. It is interesting. And to see the different responses, as I've spoken to people, yeah. people have asked about it. Um, people have their very specific thoughts and respond in a very yeah. particular and sometimes personal way based on their experience, yes. I, which I is mean, fascinating. I'm, it's fascinating. I also think from a cultural historian's perspective, we'll probably see that, I mean, this very, I mean, look, and by the way, I should point out Prince Harry and, and this, and this sometimes I get a little frustrated when it's Harry and Meghan as if they, mm-hmm. they always have to be, to, to be blamed or praised together. This is much more historic. It was way back before right. uh, before his marriage to the, to the current Duchess. And but what is interesting is that you know I think everyone expect they sorry I should say they they and he in particular have very um, sympathetic admirers, also very passionate defenders, and equally strong critics. What is interesting is that the critics this time outnumber the the sympathizers by quite a considerable margin, and probably more than we would have expected some of that is probably the book's tone there probably there, there probably are bits that aren't landing too well there are some things that, there's obviously been a lot of interviews so they can be compared side by side right but i would i might my, my i'd be interested to see in five or ten years time will there be a historian who can look back on this and say part of the reaction was that it came out at a cost of living crisis era mm-hmm. and that therefore people had a had a much lower threshold for anyone born into economic privilege right their problems yes. that could be an uh, that could be interesting and yes. you know and i think it's what's interesting to me is some of the, the stories that are picked out by people who had been 
sympathetic beforehand are things like you know the, the talk about who got the bigger bedroom at Balmoral and people saying like well how is that a problem you know right it, it, you know <laughs> yeah and, and a so small I bedroom thought, in a pal in a castle in a, yeah. in a castle in the highlands yeah I think uh, you know and and uh, to me I, I remember thinking I can, if this if the cost of living crisis is as bad Mm -hmm. as and, and it hasn't been it's so far the inflation has, in britain has not been as bad as we had expected right but it but it is still a nerve-wracking time and everyone right. here can see prices going up mm -hmm. and and you know it, it looked it wasn't his fault at all but when you had one storyline about that you know what the complaints in the book were and right. others about pensioners not being able to heat their homes yes yes you know that was just that was off the moment and there's there's nothing he could have done um, there's nothing he could have done to change that, but I think future historians will say there was an element where the timing for this was just uh, was culturally unsympathetic. And also, yes. as I say, there, there's there's a whole melange of reasons as to why this book has landed um, as convincingly to some people and as unconvincingly to others. Part of it's the personal details of the book, part of it's his previous interviews, part of it's cultural prejudices and attitudes, but I also think part of it is socioeconomic circumstances that we're dealing with at the moment. Do you think the Queen's death as well has... Ooh, but, uh, potentially, yeah. Actually, so that's a really good point, Caroline. I think um, there is... Yeah, I suppose actually because I've you, I've heard some of that. How could you've he heard know some of that? She yeah. was so sick. How could I, he have spent those last? I think if he had right, that's that's a great point. I think the points I have heard are had, and I do think this. I think had he brought it out when she was still alive, the reaction would would have been even worse. I okay. think you know it, it's yes, you can accuse tasteless or whatever people have said, but if you think back on just how angry some people were that the Oprah in interview came out when his grandfather was yes. in the hospital. My yes, the thing true. is, a 96-year-old woman is never going to be chronologically very far from a serious right. for passing away. I mean, you know, his yes. great-grandmother lived to 101. So if we... And the oldest living member of the British royal family was his great, great-aunt, Princess Alice, who died at 102 in 2004. So if we assume that the Queen would have had five or six years, you know, had she gone to the record, mm -hmm, there, there still mm -hmm. wasn't a decade left. So that he, I think he would have been accused a lot more harshly had it come out okay. when she was alive. I think what, what the publishers probably struggled with, yeah, the, there was an afterglow of the funeral where, right. yeah. where the, the royal family's approval ratings were through the roof. I mean, you had massive bumps in approval for them in Australia like it mm -hmm. mean really you know things that were not expected and um, I think in that sense he yes like, there probably was an element of where it felt like a really really bad time to have done it but in his defense I think it would you know it would be much I think the criticism worse. would have been exponentially worse had he done it when she I mean, can you imagine had she died in February he would have been accused of hastening her death Okay. Yes. You know, All so right. That's, yeah. That's what, you know that's what I think. So I think in that element, he, he. No, I, 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 I. There probably is some people responding to that, but if he was going to do a memoir, and I understand the point that, um, you know, not not ever not everyone needs to do a memoir, but right. if he had decided, right. as is his right as as a citizen to write his, to write a memoir, um, before she, but uh, sorry, after she died was was better than before. Okay. Okay. And I guess part of what um, I'd heard, and it, it does go along with that, is Charles and Camilla's approval rating as the morning sun, Charles in particular, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, and the next king and taking, you know, stepping into these shoes, which are sure. going to be impossible to fill and, and more popularity for him. Right. Through well, this well, time. And yeah, Carolyn, that's a good, yeah. I think I have this theory that Charles was almost helped by how low the bar was set by his critics that people were essentially okay. saying that the monarchy would vanish overnight when elizabeth elizabeth would be elizabeth the last mm -hmm. no one charles would make such a mistake of it and the so charles essentially had to turn up and not burn the house down for him right. to, you know <laughs> okay and, and the fact that he also has done you know some pretty exemplary things mm -hmm. in his time as king you know we're coming off this but totally voluntary decision Mm -hmm. for him to donate 250 million pounds from the crown right. renewable energy program to 
to the government during the cost of living crisis and for all the profits to go mm-hmm. um, to, to, to the government rather than to the monarchy. That That is extraordinary. Mm-hmm. And because the crown estates are essentially used to fund the monarchy so that there isn't a burden on the taxpayers um, and it's cut down to something like about, it's about 50p a, a year per person. Um, so say like 75 cents. And right. I think, um, but for him to then say, look, we're, take the 250 million. Right. Um, yeah. It's not an insig- by any standards, it's not an insignificant sum. And uh, I think, I think it, it, you know, he's, he has done also, you know, the, the, the public approval for the Prince's Trust, the charity he's done. Right. Yeah. I think yes. Camilla's approval rating just seems to be getting stronger and stronger. Yes. And my instinct is the book has helped her. Oh, okay. Uh, I, okay. Not abroad. This is where the book is interesting from a from a historical or international for a political perspective. British people are generally reacting in a very different way yes. to um to Americans. And not mm-hmm. always there's, there's some similarities. No, I, I I I do see a lot of that. Yeah, and I think I've that, sensed that. You know, there is I and sometimes you have to kind of like pull some royal commentators back because there is in fact not just royal commentators, British people in general who I can see tinglings of anti-Americanism beneath the surface starting to come up where where essentially the feeling is Mm -hmm. you can be as interested as you want in our monarchy, but you don't get to tell us what to do with it. And and that 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 feeling is getting louder and louder. I can really see it building. That's interesting. Okay. Your interest, your interest is not a right. And so, or your interest is not a voice to tell us what to do. And I suppose there's an element of that where I think in general, any, you know, I will always try to say to British people who are very, very, I find it wearying when they had such strong views on American politics and were trying to tell Americans who to vote for. <laughs> and I will always say, for not your, not your dogfight. Yeah. Um, but also that, you know, an American voter will get so much more coverage of their politicians and their political process than a British viewer will. That's inevitable. And it, and they will have a better, under, they will generally have a better understanding of it and of the complexities and nuances mm-hmm. of that particular mm-hmm. person. In the same way, right. a British viewer will get so much more coverage of the royal family and the individuals in it than mm-hmm. an international mm-hmm. audience will get. And they right. will. So for instance, to us, it's still, to a lot of British people, not all, but to a lot of people, the the Camilla Diana thing is not the first thing that goes through their head because it's it, when it comes to the Queen Consort. And they know about her campaigns like for osteoporosis and mm-hmm. reading her mm-hmm. literacy mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. particularly her work against domestic um, violence for domestic right. abuse charities. So it's interesting. I think this book has shone a floodlight on different attitudes to the monarchy and i suppose you know it, it it's also as we've said to kind of close the circle with it, it these are it, it, this is not the first time the monarchy has given this to, to the transatlantic audiences this idea of private happiness and walking mm-hmm. away over mm-hmm. public over public duty and again in the same way with edward the eighth and george the sixth right yeah I mean, essentially, we have recast Catherine Princess of Wales as the second coming of the Queen Mother, and we have cast, right. you know, those who love her adore her, and yes. she, and you know, I, I, I have said it before. I will say it again. I do think Catherine is a, you know, she has people who work for her who used to work for the Queen Mother. She has, I think, the idea that the Queen Mother has that this is a marathon, not a sprint, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you know, and in the same way, I think, you know, the, the the Catherine's critics say almost identical things about her that they used to say about the Queen Mother, um, that the smile can't be real, that she must be yes. cold, yes. you know, yes. that sort of stuff. In the same way, I mean, how many times have we heard the comparison between Meghan and Wallace? Yes, absolutely. You know, it's it's not it, it's not. Um, and again, you have these kind of these horrible stories that people say about Meghan that are not dissimilar to some of the things they used to say about Wallace. Mm-hmm. And Harry sympathizers, like Edward VIII sympathizers, have have praised this walking away, and yes. they see William like they see his great grandfather, uh-huh. or they did see his great grandfather before the Second World War as this sort of petty, vindictive, jealous bully. That's what they thought of George the Sixth before before the war. Mm-hmm. Um, it was really only the Second World War that changed his his uh, some of his critics' minds. Uh, whereas if you flip it, George the Sixth slash Williams defenders see the kind of solid, stolid man of duty. Right. Yes. And this um, feckless self-indulgent who 
who ran away and complained too much. There are it's almost a carbon copy. It's so that's so it's, interesting. You know, yes. And the American element in there yeah, with this yeah. American woman is causing all the problems or is you know tempting yeah, and, the and, royal and, away kind of thing. Well, Carolyn, that's the thing that I really I'm sort of I, so there was a great biography of Wallace Simpson here a few years ago, I think 10 years ago now, actually, by Anne Seba called That Woman. Mm-hmm. And basically what, what Anne argues in the book is Edward wanted out. Edward was not happy. And he, and it, Wallace kind of was the one who took the blame from the public mm-hmm. and from a lot of historians. And I think there are starting to be talks that this this is what we did with Megan, that it was projected onto her yeah. that she took him away when in fact, and you know, you, you don't know how much is influenced by recent events, but that is a very um, critical memoir of even his life before. before right, no, he- I, I remember an interview years ago where he said he was so glad he wasn't William and he had no interest in being king and he felt almost sorry for William. And this was years ago. Yeah. That yeah, he was really absolutely. happy to be the second. Right. The spare. The spare. Yeah. And I think it's um yeah, it's it's a very interesting repeat of these things. And it's run through royal history before many, many times. Mm-hmm. Um what dutiful or dull, you yes. know, spirited or selfish. Those are the two that we yeah. and that's an eternal question we have about ourselves. So again, it's royalty functions almost as this avatar of, of discussions we have within and about ourselves. Right, right. I, that is fascinating. And I, I wonder when you're talking about pe- the way people project, I remember yeah. a lot of reading about Anne Boleyn, who's my big obsession. Um, yeah. And and it was the women who hated the idea of ki- the king being able to set aside his loyal, dutiful wife right. for a, another woman or a younger woman or, you yeah. know. And well, that certainly happened with Wallace Simpson. I mean, I think yeah. Anne's book is really interesting where she talks about, you know, there were real concerns because particularly for working a middle class woman in Britain, because at the time, many of them did not work. It was still an age when a lot of mm-hmm. the money came from the husband. Mm-hmm. And if the hus- they felt that if the husband could just leave and divorce was made uh, easier, then he would then then many of them would be left with nothing and and so it's interesting it it it, it, it always taps a nerve culturally yes. These things. yes yes i and that's fascinating and i love yeah. the way you can see it through history so when you talk about these times in the shadow of history right. and it will i think take five ten years before we really see both what the queen's death and after 70 years of yeah. so many people i met saying i've never known another queen i i People are having trouble saying King Charles instead of Prince Charles. Yeah. And the first few times I heard them sing God Save the, and I'm still singing Queen and half the people around me are saying, you know, it just takes a while. Yeah, it will. Inevitably it will. And and, and also part of that is that it's a change in gender. So it's a Mm -hmm. change in monarchical pronouns for for people. So that will be, I think, um, that, I mean, it's interesting. I think people are kind of caught on. No, I think I took a lot. Of, I mean, Princess of Wales happened quite quickly. Yeah. But I suppose um, what they have done quite sensibly is that they got, they took care of all of that within the first sort of 72 hours after right. after her death. Yeah. Yeah. But it just, it, that moment of change. Yeah, absolutely. And then the moment of, of Harry's book and what he's saying and the leaving. Yeah. I think, you know, in 10 years, yeah. we'll be able to see it with some um distance and and right now absolutely it's, it's I, I, the, yeah. the ink i mean historically the ink isn't dry on this book yet mm-hmm. really and i think a lot of it will depend on what he does next right um right. i think if there is another memoir i think people i think that would be i think people will judge them will start to judge them all th- that series harshly i think if, if that is the if that is um that was an unintentional pun bookend between yeah. the Oprah, the Oprah Winfrey interview and, and Spare. Yeah. Okay. And they then go into focusing on the Archibald Foundation and charity. Mm-hmm. Then I mm-hmm. think it could be judged a lot more kindly. Yeah. Also what happens in May with the coronation and what happens right. with his relationship with his brother. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I think it's, it's, um, it, it, it'll be interesting. And yeah, we're talking, I would say five to 10 years before we yeah. can actually say, and, well, and, and I, you know, you know, sometimes you, you try to, 
I think like don't make don't make an announcement or yeah. a pronouncement <laughs> that in five years someone's going to play back to you on the radio and you were completely wrong <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> you know it, 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 um so yeah I think it I think it'll it'll um it'll take it'll, it'll take, take some years. time yeah absolutely so speaking of the coronation which we know is coming in May and we will have another queen consort so let's use yes. that as a segue to our most Wallace, recent yeah, yeah. queen consort um and I know interestingly when um, Bertie at the time before he became king yeah was courting Elizabeth she was not really interested in marrying into no. the royal family even though he was the Duke of York he was not yeah he was there... in the succession but he wasn't next or anything no he was it was his elder brother the future Edward VIII and what was quite interesting is there was this story that went around that is repeated on and on that she she didn't want the younger brother she wanted the elder brother mm -hmm. and all the private letters from the time and the diaries prove the exact opposite that in fact had you know she first of all i looked at tour schedules and they he was away he was out of it the, the, all this time when they were supposed she, she she was supposedly running into him at all these parties he was in asia <laughs> so um uh and she was a very short window between her coming out as a debutante mm -hmm. and 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 marrying uh, the birdie the duke of york I describe her father in the book as a royalist with no interest in the royals in that he supported the monarchy but couldn't think of anything worse than having to marry into the royal family for his children. <laughs> and she came from great wealth. Her father mm -hmm. was the Earl of Strathmore. She grew up in Macbeth's castle, mm -hmm. which was where they spent most of their, you know, then there was the English home at the uh, state at St. Paul's Waldenbury in their mansion in London. And her life was parties and overnight trains and servants and cotillions and all the rest of it. And she, it was she didn't need the money. She, in mm -hmm. fact, in many ways, I think what she feared was that she would have. She said, "I would, I would have a husband whose life was the nation, and all mm -hmm. her privacy would go." Mm -hmm. And there's a really tragic letter that I read between her and her younger brother, um, David Boslyan, mm -hmm. where she says, "And that you know, I felt a door close behind me, and it would never open again." Um, and she was 22. Right. You know when she said yes to him, but he he did he and it's in, I think it was a story of three parts. The first was he when he proposed, she said no because she didn't love him and she didn't want to marry into the royal family. The second time he proposed and she said no, I think she started to fall in love with him, but she still didn't want to marry into the royal family. <laughs> and by the third time, the the she had I think she'd fallen in love enough with him and been persuaded by people around her that marrying into the royal family was 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 best for the country that she that she did it and i think i mean i sort of talk about a bit about in the book about how sort of a house party i find out about that that i there's very good evidence that that was used to sort of bounce her into the decision okay. and also crucially that her mother cecilia you know really liked bertie and thought he was mm -hmm. a wonderful man and she said you know the windsor men or you know the royal men is, um they only just changed the name yeah. but the royal men are basically made or broken by their wives that's what cecilia believed and so okay. So she she felt, as did Queen Mary, Bertie's mother, that Elizabeth would be the making of Bertie because she was funny, mm -hmm. uh, great sense of humor, which is probably one of the main themes of the second half of the book. Right. Yes. Um, and she, and the first half is really about how she became who she was, and sort of the the tragedies and the strength that shaped her. But she was his sense of humor. She was his um, social guiding hand. And she was for for many. She was his backbone, right. and and his chamomile tea in a way. She calmed him. She um, strengthened him, and she brought him out of his shell. So I can see why Queen Mary thought Elizabeth Bowes Lyon was absolutely the one that that her shy, stammering son should marry. Right. And tell us about the marriage because it seems like if you look at sort of the history of royal marriages, yeah. this is a good one. Yeah, in many ways, it was an unfortunately good one for the royals that came after them. Yes, <laughs> uh, because it's because it it's interesting sometimes. You know, when people say like the royal family are supposed to be perfect, the perfect example of family life, and you think that's relatively new. Mm -hmm. Um, that's mm -hmm. really pretty much Victoria and George the Sixth, and right, and Elizabeth, um, the. Uh, Elizabeth the um sorry Elizabeth the Queen Mother she later became Elizabeth Boslan and George mm -hmm. VI were very much in love and were very happy and so it wasn't a lie that they were projecting they were I think they were really truly deeply in love with each other I mean the the letters I find when he died the letters I read sorry mm -hmm. when he died she was uh, devastated I mean really devastated and she talks she talks she writes about grief 
in a way that I just find so so moving and and relatable when she says it knocks you about it, it kind of grief batters you around and and she's she's writing this she's like sitting by a brook and she she mm. she can't imagine her heart ever feeling happy again I mean it's really wow it's it's really gut punching stuff and, and and also I think for Elizabeth the marriage she grief mixed with shock because she really, like her daughter Princess Margaret, held on to the belief that Bertie was getting better and that um mm-hmm. the, the, the 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 treatment on his lung had bought him years, not months. And right. so when he died in February 1952, she was in complete shock for a very long time, to the point that Winston Churchill sort of was worried that she was going to do a Queen Victoria. Oh, right, would, yes. And withdraw from public life. So I think it was a marriage that, you know, I mean, George adored, worshipped the ground she walked on and told her everything. I mean, she really was his right hand during the Second yes. World War. And yes, she interestingly tried to downplay that because she didn't want the attention being taken off him even after he was dead. But we mm. do now know from people like Jock Colville and from Tommy Lassells, who were um, mm-hmm. Churchill and the King's secretary, say, no, we'd be to- he told her absolutely everything. She knew all the intelligence reports mm-hmm. and he talked mm-hmm. about everything with the Queen. So it was a happy marriage, but it was a fruitful marriage for the monarchy because this, you know, Elizabeth had as um, Cecil Beaton called her, she was a marshmallow forged in a welding machine. Yes. So there, so there, so there was fluff there, but uh, she, she was, you know, when Hitler calls you the most dangerous woman in Europe, it's, right? It's the best compliment that's you're the, ever going to get. That's a huge compliment. Yeah, I Absolutely. love that. I love that. But, I love um, that. And then at yeah, the I same it. time, there's that wonderful letter that the king writes to then Princess Elizabeth on her marriage. Yes, and yeah, yeah. praises, you know, Mummy, who, you know, I think is the most wonderful person in the world. And it's just, he can't miss any opportunity to no. praise his wife. I mean, he, no, he I, just, it's just lovely. I love that letter. I'm so glad you did too, because I think what he, he says to the future Elizabeth II and her marriage in 1947, you know, you've been brought up by Mummy. And it's a mm-hmm. real tribute to to Elizabeth. And, you know, it's in the book, I... The, when Elizabeth had pneumonia, Elizabeth Bose Lyon, mm-hmm. and she was worried about her health, she left little notes for her husband to find in case she died on you know, how to be a sweet and gentle father and never shout mm-hmm. at the children. Mm-hmm. She was, you know, so I think it was that finding out that side of her was fascinating. Mm-hmm. It, there's just this loving, so there is this steely, yeah, you know, stay in London during the Blitz, all of that, but there's also this tenderness. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's just quite extraordinary. Well, I think for me, part of the thing that really stood out was that we had hit a very certain point culturally where she was kind of the villain of the royal family. Mm. I mean, there was a very definite point where, you know, if you, you know, the crime is that the Netflix shows had a huge impact and yeah. she's, she's a little spiky in season one and two. She's kind mm-hmm. of monstrous by season mm-hmm. four. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think the Marcia Warren character performance in season five has pulled that back. And by right. the way, this is not a dig at Marion Billy, who's a brilliant actress who played her in season three. And four. Right. They, they have to work with the script. Um, but it's interesting to me that we tend to cast old women as the villain. And, you know, mm-hmm. so they needed someone to say something snobbish. They needed someone to say something cruel. They give it to her. Right. And, um, it, it, and so, and, and it pushes this idea that she deliberately undereducated her daughter, her, particularly Elizabeth II. Mm-hmm. Margaret felt jealous that Elizabeth had such a, a much better education than her. Um, mm-hmm. And also I think Margaret would have loved to have gone to school. And she then saw that being allowed for her niece, Princess Anne. But uh, right. this idea of the Elizabeth was this like icy, it's really embedded now. And I think that's why I spent, you know, the first five chapters, probably the first four chapters are about a younger her to try and say, right. you know, this, there's a, there's a lack of charity that we show to the elderly and to elderly women in particular that I yes. find white frustrating yes and so I, I know and i think Mar- i love marcia warren who plays the queen mother in season five of the crown mm-hmm. i just wanted to be given so much more because she managed to she marcy warren by the way i think is one of the best british comedic actresses she's just extraordinary um and she has brilliant timing and she softens so many of the lines that, that they give to the queen mother right um, so I think she's fabulous. I think she's and, brilliant. And they, I think for a while, at least in that depiction, not this season, but previously, they miss all the humor. 
right? There's, it's, which it's for me was, mean. which for, which for me and my, oh, she's about as funny as a wart. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. She, she's all the, she's all the charm of a hangnail. Um, and she is, you know, she's, she's borderline evil by season right. four. There's, there's yeah. the, that eighth episode, Hereditary Principle, where I was just sort of staring at the screen yeah. um, about, about her nieces. And right. you, yes. you sound like you're, you're protesting too much when you say there is almost nothing in that episode from start to finish that is true. Right. apart from, and i think you know i i and i'm in an unusual position with this i usually defend a show's right to historical inaccuracy read a non-fiction book mm-hmm. uh, but i also think if you're going to make up that much just just make up a fictional royal family right um, yes yes where where i where i where i personally have a bit of a moral problem with it is when the crown uses the photographs of the real person at the end yes. and that to me is just completely collapsing the credibility of fiction and right. they did that they did that with that episode uh, on Narissa and Catherine mm-hmm. Bosland, mm-hmm. Pieces. they had the real photographs at the end and that yes. kind of that did not sit well with me um because they're claiming something because it's because that because right. they, yeah. they, well because if you're going to use the real photographs you better use you the, real tell story. the real story but that's that's I and and particularly for people like Narissa and Catherine who would not have had the ability to tell their story if you're right. going to tell it it's not going to get told that often you really should be trying with this yeah you're and, you're appropriating um, their voices for your absolutely. own for your and own also, purpose and not for theirs and also to, to to move away from the monarchy and the queen mother for a minute it completely misrepresented how people with mental health yeah. problems and cognitive development issues were treated and it made them look unique which they weren't right and and i think when the history of mental health and mental care in this country has been at times so distressing but so nuanced and so underrepresented that to me completely missed the mark Mm -hmm. of, of an opportunity and also as much as i i don't care mess around with dates and all the rest of it that's a drama but when you are accusing someone who was alive and who still has grandchildren alive yes at yes. this point still had a child alive mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, when you are accusing them of something that that is child abuse yes uh, because that is essentially what they were accusing the queen mother of doing they were mm-hmm. saying that because she was so embarrassed by them Right. Yes. The minute she became queen consort, she directly intervened to order their institutionalization. Yes. Then, in this like bizarre moment at the end of the episode, they somehow accuse her. Princess Margaret's therapist reveals that the queen mother somehow rounded up um, three more mentally vulnerable members of the extended family and had them locked up as well. I mean, that is a that what that is abuse that is that is the mm-hmm. abuse of the vulnerable and to me when that was so, so not what happened right um, yes. i mean it's almost she had it was, it's almost the diametric opposite of what happened for that um that did really really bother me because i don't I, I mean, obviously, I've written a book on the Queen, or I was at that point of, mm-hmm. you know, starting a book on the Queen Mother. So obviously, I have a vested interest in the history. But from a viewer's perspective and a historian's perspective, it left me feeling quite uncomfortable and angry that the lives of five women who were institutionalized were just being completely cut and pasted and edited to the right. sort of storyline. That, to me, um, there was a there was. It, it was it was a there was a whiff there was a stink to that because um, they're using real people to do that yeah this was this is a real thing this is and real it, people and and a real story that you're manipulating and beyond yeah, it, yeah. It, and it felt emotionally manipulative it yeah. felt and you know I the, I don't know if you've seen a movie years and years ago called the Magdalen Sisters that was made in Ireland about mm-hmm. about the Magdalen laundries and the system that existed in the Irish Republic whereby fallen women from about the time of independence until i think the 1980s including victims of sexual assault if you're if you were if you're a male relative contacted the parish priest you could be put into um run by the magdalene sisters the nuns they were laundries because people didn't have washing machines okay and you weren't paid you were essentially enslaved in these you were put in you weren't allowed to leave you weren't paid you did the laundry for them the convents collected the profits and you were only allowed out if a male relative went to your priest and got a letter signed to say that you could go. And 
uh, thousands it's happened to thousands of women over wow. decades and yes. really the first time it came to the public's attention where it was properly discussed was a movie i think in the late night i remember i was very young when it came out but i can remember people being shocked that this was being even in northern ireland people were really shocked that that this had that this was coming out and the magdalene sisters i think amory duff is on it she plays mm, one of the okay. one, of, one of the fall one of the fallen and um there is a a storyline so first of all what i will say is what the magdalene sisters did was oh yes it was fiction and all the cases were in but they were inspired by real women okay and it shone a light on something that had happened in irish history that was was horrific i mean was really was just monstrous Mm -hmm. when you think right in front of you there were thousands of women yeah being stripped of every civil right enslaved you weren't they weren't paid and they would they would sit at these tables and they would be given gruel while the convent's operator sat at the head table with bacon and butter and toast it, oh. it was just, it's really and, and the level of of humiliation that they were put through for their sins was was uh, awful okay was yeah. awful but what the what the Magdalene sisters did was there was I can't remember whether this I think she might even be some two people but there was a character called Crispa um or Crispina sorry excuse me Crispina and she suffered from an eating disorder and she also had been a victim of abuse that is when i say it is the performance of of the actress who plays crispina whose name escapes me so i apologize for that but the the performance of the of what happens to Chris, crispina in the um in the in the laundries and in this system of how people with eating disorders were looked at and particularly you know fallen women were treated at that time in Irish history that is it was harrowing but it did something important because right. it, it made you think about it and so I'm not saying at all that you can't tell stories like Crispina's in Ireland or Nerissa and Catherine's in, right. in, in, in Britain but you have to approach it like the Magdalene sisters approached it not the way season four of the crown approached it yes. that's, that's my that's my great yes. No, I understand. And and there are stories that need to be told, but they need to be sure. told in a respectful, honorable way to honor the people involved. Absolutely. And, and, you, and you could have you could have really made an interesting point, which is that, you know, I find out when when the Queen Mother found out that the, you know, she wasn't really the crying kind of overact, like it was your favorite son's children wasn't mm-hmm. sorry, your favorite mm-hmm. brother's mm-hmm. children wasn't. Mm-hmm. Every every sprinkling is put on to make it as emotionally distressing as possible. But you know, when she found out that they were still alive, she started sending like checks to the to the hospital and things mm, for mm-hmm. for their birthdays and Christmas and Christmas gifts for all the other patients and parties. You could also make you can make a great episode of saying why was why didn't she ask? You know, why yeah. did it take? You know, what, I mean, okay. First of all, I should point out Elizabeth had a very large family, and her brother Jock had died when the girls were children, and his widow Fenella basically went back to her family and it was her family the Hepburn Stuart Forbes Trefusis who raised them mm-hmm. and so I can understand you know Elizabeth really was never that close to them but you could have made a really brilliant episode not about outright Machiavellian cruelty but about right. this this thing in British society at the time where you just didn't ask yes and, right and that's right. A, that's that is not to Elizabeth's credit that at all um she's but it could have been such a brilliant episode to say you know, you felt bad when you found out they were alive, but you didn't ask you didn't questions ask. before. Right. And right. in that sense, and she had, look, she really had nothing to do with them going into that institution. The dates, you know, it, it's at all. The dates don't even remotely correlate. But there could have been such a brilliant point of what we all, what, well, I mean, it was before my time, but certainly in this country. Yes. There was a whole system for upper middle and working class people where if you had mental health problems or uh, cognitive developmental issues, mm-hmm. you were put into a system that was designed to keep you out of sight. Out, out of mind. sight, right. You know, right. It's, it's not necessary. And I understand some people who worked at the hospital where Nerissa and Catherine were cared for were really upset by the episode. They had the best of care that was available, but the care that was available was mm. to our eyes subpar. Right. Yes. Um, yes. And so you could have made a really great episode about the care of the vulnerable at that time and how even with the best intentions, there was an indifference and there was right. an out of sight, out of mind. And there was a callousness in the indifference rather uh, yeah, than... Yeah, it's a chosen 
not yeah, knowing. Uh, you, you choose exactly. not to look for it. You exactly. choose not to ask the questions. And, and why is that? What, exactly. And were mm-hmm. there many times where, and you know, Elizabeth had this tendency where she just, if it was, she kind of really conformed to family hierarchy. Mm-hmm. And so, she, I mean, I'm sure, I would imagine she would have said, well, that was Fenella's. That was, it was their mother. It wasn't me. It uh-huh. was their mother's decision. And, you know, the, the girls had gone back to live with the Hepburn um, Stuart Forbes Trefusis's who had cared for them for as long as they could. What's really, you know, Nerissa and Catherine and their cousins, Inamea, Ethelreda and Rosemary, I think was the other cousin. They had lived in a cottage on the estate that was built for them or, or sort of decorated for them by their grandfather, Lord Clinton, their mother, Fenella's, um, the, the, the Fenella's father. And they were cared for up until the point where it was very clear they couldn't be cared for at home right. anymore. At which point they 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 went into, into the, the, the system as it was. And I suppose, actually, in many ways, had you been wanting to keep them secret, you would have said, keep them in the cottage, keep them there regardless yeah, yes, of what yes, happens. Yes, yes, Do not yes. put them into a hospital. So, no, I think, I mean, it was, it really was that the Clintons couldn't look after, they, they just mm-hmm. couldn't be done anymore with the best will in the world. But there was such a, an, uh, an opportunity there to discuss, you know, what as a society did we or do we look away from? Right. And, and yes. okay, we don't look away from that anymore. There are plenty of things that, that everyone that knows. That we still look away that from. That we still do that. And it's yeah. not malicious, but it does have a really horrible impact. So to me, it was, it was, it, that was. It yeah, was you could have told that story and that could have been powerful and compelling. Absolutely. Rather Absolutely. But, than but, yes. make it into something it was yeah. not. But for me, I mean, just sort of t- in terms of the humor, which is really, I kept waiting for her to be to be funny and then crying, and because she was funny, she was really funny. She was really funny, yeah. And, and that's and what I, comes through here. I mean, even well, look, the title I mean, and the way it's written, it's do you like, it's, yeah, look, yeah, it's I mean, funny, it's fun. Thank it's fun you, to read. thank you, Caroline. Look, I won't lie. From my perspective and my editor's perspective, the fact that they didn't use any of her jokes and that was a bit of a godsend because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know, and after forty episodes, we sort of you know we they, they weren't there. Um, no, they're, you they're... Few, you actually see a few in season five, but you don't in before the book, no. before seasons one through four. No, and and see that's what I mean. Even just a little detail, like she wanted to call them drinky poos because cocktails, cocktails too hard, hard to work. Yeah, know? which it just, is. Um, but it's but... just, but it's just her. I mean, that's just yeah. her voice and her lightness. And you know what you see here is someone who is having doing her best. Not, so you mentioned not doing a Queen Victoria, right? It, she was devastated right. by the death. Yeah but made different decisions mm-hmm. and was involved in things and yes. was this uh, sort of sparkly humor, yeah, uh, you know, which is yeah. just lovely. And so she, it's, it's too bad because we have these moments of her in the, in the war being this strong, wonderful force. And then I just don't understand how that all disappears in some tellings, like in the crown. All of that just disappears. Yeah. Well, she's almost, uh, you know, but it's what we do to old women. Yeah. It's what, yeah. It's what we do. Um, you know, the hero of the king's speech is the villain of the crime. You know, that's, yeah. that's, yeah. that's, that's just it. Okay. That's um, okay. And we're not, we, we, we either make them, I mean, uh, you, you know, I sort of a friend pointed out that, you know, Season three and season four of The Crown, she is always, watch this, she is always either eating, drinking, snoring, or saying something horrible. That's one of the four things that she does. <laughs> four for, things for she's allowed to do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's, and there is, there's a, there's a, um, there's a lack of, there's a, there's a meanness about her, mm-hmm. her weight gain, and about, there's just, a, there's a cruelty about her physicality. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. it is prevalent, not just in that show, but in, in many of the ways we talk about people. And I talk about that in the book. Mm-hmm. That I think right. you know, one of the things that's so eye watering to me is that, you know, her brother in law and her sister in law had been seen beaming and smiling at Hitler. And many of the British upper classes thought that was fine, but Elizabeth getting fat was terrible. Right. And it, yes. you know, yes. it, it's just, it's, it's, you're through the looking glass into, mm-hmm. into what people's priorities are. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that's just upper class snark. I think the way we present, women as they 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 age they're as they either age, yeah. they are either monsters or they are um sort of fabulously catty 
mm-hmm. or they're mm-hmm. not. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's the that's the three options. So, yeah, I suppose that's um, they're they're grotesque or they're giggly, and that we don't really give them much else to do. Right, and and, and in the giggly. Yeah. So what's different here is she's laughing, but there's so much heart and wit, yeah, and, and intelligence. So it's not just this vapid. No, you, you, you know, she, there's so much to her. There's a lot to her. And she's, look, she's not, I, she, I think she would want to say, mm-hmm. not an intellectual. She really, you know, right. and, and what I mean by that is not unintelligent. That's not the same thing. Right. Yes. But yes. not someone who was interested in reading books and philosophy or theory. Mm-hmm. You know, she's very religious, mm-hmm. but she loved a good PG Woodhouse book. She loved a good right. comedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, she loved you know she 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 loved the golden girls you know there were little things mm-hmm. that i mm-hmm. like to add in and you know there's some really touching moments even later in her 70s when she is she's refusing to fire gay people on her staff right yes even though yes. she's been and, and by the way her views were very conservative i mean and a very consistently yeah. conservative lady and um that was important to me to capture that as well because i think if someone's liberal or conservative or whatever if it's something that really matters to them tell the truth about that right you know, give yes. give them that nuance and so she was a very conservative lady very very loyal friend Mm-hmm. and that was something I, I find immensely sympathetic about her strangely and I I saw you know the book is really the last five chapters are mostly about her, her humor was is because mm-hmm. it because it's easier to research that because the people who I interviewed who knew her were still alive and could remember the 60s through the 90s okay. yeah or the early right. 2000s the first half first of all there's no one there is no one alive and right. the earliest yeah. memory I got was from someone who as a child knew her in 1937 but before that there's nothing okay and, okay. Um, and also it was important for me to t- in chapter two to tell the story of the first world war and what she saw yes. as a teenager yes because yes. that was I think that shaped her in a way that she's ne- I think if a, a lot of Elizabeth was, you know, the steel that you see in the Second mm-hmm. World War was right. forged in Elizabeth in the First World War. That's yes, what you cause, see. Because it was right there in front of her, in her home. Horrific. I mean, re- I mean, yeah. really kind of the stuff that, a lot of the stuff that she, um, she wasn't good with goodbyes. And it's she was never, she hated a farewell and she would kind of go out of her way to avoid painful farewell scenes. And then when you see letters from her when she's 17 and she's saying, we have to say goodbye to all the soldiers that our parents were taking care of when they turned their castle into a, a military mm-hmm. hospital. And she's saying, we're saying goodbye to them and we've nursed them back to health and they're going back to the trenches and they're probably going to die. Yeah. They're, and you think you're doing that weekly. It's yeah. it's really, and she said on her 17th birthday, I'll never be happy again because every day you'd open the newspaper to see who'd been killed. Yes. And you, you might know, recognize so like, those names from someone that always. had been in her I mean, home. There's, yeah. actually, there's, a, there's a great line to talk a sort of lip slightly into fiction, shining a light in history, because it can sometimes. Mm-hmm. There's a brilliant line in Downton Abbey that just boils it all down into one sentence where the character of um, Lady Sybil Crawley says, mm-hmm. it feels like everybody who I ever danced with is dead. Yes, that's right. You yeah, know? I remember that. Yeah. yeah. And I thought that was, that, that I, and when I, that, you see that. I, I mean, mm-hmm. I would be interested to know actually, was that taken from a real aristocrat or did, or did Julian maybe piece together? Yeah. Just the whole impression because it hits such a beautifully written show. And I think um But that really does capture that in a nutshell, then yeah. one sentence, that is what mm-hmm. a lot of girls of Elizabeth's background felt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so to see her grow up with that and then, you know, take yeah. on her role in all these various ways throughout. So I want to um be respectful of your time because this has been so fun. I could talk to you no, for I've another had a great hour. Time. Thank you for having me. But <laughs> but I do love I do love this this final line, and so I'm just going to read it. And she's talking sure. to um, Billy, who's her footman, yeah. and that's the other thing because these people have been in her life for such a long time, yeah. and she is yeah, loyal yeah. to them. Uh, you know, so yes, she was part of an aristocracy, and she understood status and all of that. Yeah. But she treats these people with such affection in a lot of ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so she says, we're two old dears, really, aren't we, William? But we have had some fun. And I love that. To me, yeah. that's just her, that she's talking to someone. We're old dears together. I love that. I lo- I'm so I glad love you liked that. that because I could not figure out how to end it. How to uh-huh. end the book because it, it's not you know it's it's a skimming stone biography it's mm-hmm. not like young and down and fair and mm-hmm. um something 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 yeah uh, and then 
someone who knew Billy told me that. And I thought, there it is. That's there it, it is. And, because... and, then, and, then, and it was, and luckily, I found it then corroborated in another interview. And I was like, okay, we've got two sources. We could say confidently that that was, she yeah. said that. So, and that's just, that's just such a wonderful way. It just sort of sums up everything because it's like yeah. she was so realistic with herself. She's not saying she's perfect, but mm, no, 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 no. Had no. some fun. <laughs> you know? I, you know, just it was funny. I thought, gosh, what a great thing to be able to say at the end of your life. Yeah. We have had some fun, haven't we? Yeah. And to have someone, you know, we're two old dears. I love that. Yeah. Too. It was like, I mean, you know, funny. I, I, without sort of dwelling on it too much, I, you know, there'd be no, one very significant death that I dealt with in the year before, but they're having a couple of deaths among, you know, friends and extended mm, friends. Mm-hmm. And and I've been thinking a lot about death and what do you want at the end? And, you know, I think, I mean, she was a very religious person and, mm-hmm. and she, the, the death was Christian. She had her chaplain with her mm-hmm. and her daughter mm-hmm. with her. But when the clock is slowing or the candles dimming slightly to be able to say, we have had some fun, haven't we? I just, that really, really touched me. And I thought, yeah. life's, a, life's a crazy, difficult thing. But if you can ha- if you're lucky enough mm-hmm. to have some fun, what a wonderful thing to be able to look back upon. Yes. And I think in a lot of places, a lot of situations, she chose to have some fun. She chose yeah, absolutely. not to do the Victoria approach and to get over that devastating no. grief and to yeah, yeah. put and, herself and she, back you know, in a position yeah i think that's a great way of looking at it. and one story i just couldn't figure out a way to to, to work this thing because it, it but she um she she had moments of depression and she talked about it actually with the actor sir alec guinness who mm, star wars okay. fans will recognize as obi-wan kenobi mm-hmm. costume drama francis king charles the first in um uh-huh. in Cromwell. but alec guinness you know she was talking about her depression with them and then they were, they were next to each other i think um at, at dinner and, and she put her fork into the potato and it skidded off the plate and then she said to him but then sometimes you look down and your potato falls off your plate <laughs> And you laugh and uh-huh. you know that you'll laugh again. And so every time her and Alec Guinness saw each other, they would say potatoes. Ah, um, just sort of oh, like, you know, which I yeah. thought was quite a nice, a nice thing. That is Silly, nice. nice. Yeah. Yeah. To be able to see that humor, you know, in of a course. difficult moment. Yeah. Of course it is. And, and, you know, she, you know, she even, she wrote, tried to make a, a few jokes in her letter to her mother-in-law when the Nazis bombed Buckingham Palace. So I mm-hmm. think this is someone mm-hmm. who really, who really tried um, to, to, to see the, the, when she could, you know, when she right. could. Right. Yeah. And, and, to, and to, she just approaches so many things with kindness from her husband and her children all the way up to this lovely exchange with a footman. It was yeah. just a level of kindness. The, you there know, is... We all stumble. We all have a cranky oh, day. Yeah, she could, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have wanted to cross Elizabeth, I think right. um, at, at all. Um, but but I don't think it was this sort of like Machiavellian evil. I just right. think I mean one of the the people who worked for her said she could give a look that would freeze fire, mm-hmm. and um, mm-hmm. I know I know those people, and um, and it's a good weapon to have. It's a it's a good yeah. weapon to have because I don't think she ever really apart from I mean I mean Wallace Simpson really did feel that Elizabeth yes. was responsible for the for the public backlash against her which i can understand i don't think it's totally accurate but i can see why wallace simpson would have felt that yeah um but i think that the harshness has been overstated yes and the so so, but but it was important to me not to completely leave the harshness out of the book as well and 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 to say look there were moments where she made mistakes there were there were moments where she realized she made mistakes other moments where she did not realize that Mm -hmm. she she behaved sharply mm-hmm. and i also but also i think that the joy of writing any of these people is the nuance and to find right. all of it and all the the complexities that, that weave together and, and at the end of the book hopefully you can say as i <laughs> we were two old dears that we've had some fun together yes well that's you how know. i felt as i as i was finishing it i, I can't wait to read it again because it was so funny. oh well you know i i felt i felt like with elizabeth we've had some fun yes. you know i felt i i had a great great time writing this book and i will be very grateful to the libraries and to the people who knew her who shared some of their memories they're you know the there wasn't um, time to track down everyone. Of course, not royals know mm-hmm. so many people. Some people just don't want to talk to historians or authors. They're right, very private. Yeah. But but I find you know people who were immensely kind to share it. I take very um, gratefully anyone's memories because there there are 
most precious commodities, both in the end, aren't they? Right. And and to be able to then share them and create of this of view course. of a life, a very complete and complex life that is just delightful to spend some time with her thanks to this oh, thank book you. so thank wow, you so Carla, much. that's really kind no no thank you it, it's thank wonderful and and i do think you know as we prepare for the coronation of another queen consort it yeah. is a nice time and another marriage that it that does seem i mean i don't know the king or queen consort but they certainly seem as you watch them together this is a couple that seems to be a strong, loving relationship. Well, look, I mean, to sort of look back to where we started from, the Duke of Sussex in his memoir, I might be paraphrasing here, so I hope this is a decent enough um, quote. He says something like, my father and Camilla had taken Starcross to whole new levels. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I think I think he's, you know, whatever. And it's difficult because, of course, it's it's hard not to look back on, on, the, on the pain. Right, uh, yes. I suppose that's life as well, isn't it? You're always looking back on, on, on different things. There, there, it's all, it's complicated. But, yeah. But there, there was, you know, there was a lot of love in this marriage. And I think there's a lot. A lot. So I think yeah. these queen consorts do play a really wonderful role. And um, I think as we get ready for that coronation, it's very exciting. So thank you, Gareth, so thank much. Thank you, Caroline. This is such a wonderful here interview. And- being willing to be on video with me so thank you <laughs> no, all. No, sorry to your viewers I look <laughs> no thank you and thank you everyone for joining us and I'll I'll have all the um, details on the books and everything in the show notes but thank you and thank you Gareth it has been a pure delight to talk about so many oh, thank you Caroline I've had a really great afternoon thank you thank you